Hey everybody, I wanted to introduce you to Michael Curtis. He's a friend of mine that I met because I was tuning a sound system or was preparing to tune a sound system, um, just knowing that that's a really important part of, of any church's setup. If you can't have that right, it's it doesn't matter what you put into it. It's not going to sound good. And so I personally was trying to learn more, and I found Michael and his trainings through uh, learning how to use a certain software. I'll let him get into that a little bit more. But yeah, I just really appreciated what he was doing, what he was teaching, and wanted to share it with you guys. So um, Michael, do you want to just share with us who you are and what you're up to and yeah, just what you do? Absolutely, Adam. Thank you so much for having me on. So yes, what I do, I am a systems engineer. So I make concerts, venues, churches, backyard, you know, beer release parties, whatever, just sound awesome. So I'm uh, responsible for making sure there are the right speakers in the right place, point in the right direction so that everyone can engage what's going on on stage. And so that's also... Uh, not only am I implementing the actual systems, but I'm designing them. So I'm using software and with certain budgets and parameters from each show that I'm with or a church service that I'm helping make happen uh, and able to put speakers in the right spot with this software of different types and engineer that make that happen. So if I'm hanging the systems once we've already designed it, I'm designing it. Another thing what I'm doing is tuning, just like Adam said, that's getting out a bunch of measurement microphones, putting them all in a row in front of our sound system right here and making sure it's going to sound good. So it's almost like um, I've already taken the picture with the camera, with uh, the system design, and now I, I get to do a little bit of Photoshop in the field to make sure everything is going from maybe a B-plus rig over to an A-plus rig. But all that summed up, my responsibility is making sure um, at any concert, venue, or service I'm a part of that you have a fantastic canvas to mix on because no one really loves painting on a wet paper napkin. So if your system is not sounding good, uh, that might be the case. So I share uh, what I know on my YouTube channel, put out a video every week. And so I understand not everyone watching this may want to be a systems engineer, or learn how to design, you know, arena level sound systems, but maybe you're looking at upgrading your system or your portable church, wanting to get the best out of your couple of K-12s on some sticks. I'm sure there's something that'll be useful for you in here and you can check that out on the internet. So in addition to system engineering, I still like the mix. I do that as well. This is a show I got to do in the middle of COVID. Uh, I had the pleasure of getting to design, install, or just deploy, tune, and mix the show. Kind of, so it's uh, sometimes it is kind of fun to drive the own car that you got to build. So that, that yeah. was cool. Um, and then I'm a bass player. Uh, I do some studio sessions around here as well as serve at my home church. I love getting to play that, uh, be on the other side of the console every once in a while. I live in Northwest Arkansas, beautiful part of mm. the the state it is the home of walmart which is why a lot or the headquarters and that's why a lot of uh resources are in the 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 area to help make shows happen which is pretty cool this is my beautiful family we got another one on the way so pray for me and uh, so we, <laughs> yeah. but we are excited uh, to keep growing our family so lastly, why in the world should you trust me? Adam just found some random guy on the internet who put out some cool tutorial videos, uh, but I've had the wonderful pleasure of working with these artists and, and, and talent um, uh, across my career. Uh, very well thankful for those opportunities. Uh, in addition, I love teaching. So I got to teach at Live Sound Summit 2022. I presented right before Robert Scoville, which was an incredibly intimidating experience. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he was he was actually on the zoom call and like i said something and like he put something in the chat and i was like oh hi it's him that guy and so yeah yeah and so our audience too might not know exactly who that is um so if you are using virtual soundcheck you can thank robert scoville the guy that designed that so um that's an amazing tool and if you're not using that definitely recommend looking into how you can accomplish that but I mean, I, I've seen him speak too and him tell the story of how he thought up of this idea and some other yeah. crazy things that he, he has done for the audio world. So definitely someone to check out and definitely someone that would be nerve wracking to, to open up for. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. No, he he's an incredibly kind human being and just like loves sharing and is just good at his job. So 
Yes, and we are very thankful to have that man. I've been on uh, with Samantha Potter and Church Sound Podcast. I actually talked about live stream loudness streaming uh, mm. because before I really jumped into systems engineering uh, in this studio, um, I don't tell a whole lot of people. I like to master records, and that's kind of my when I'm tired of being on shows, I get to do that. Um, but anyway, so so loudness is something I've been comfortable with for a long time. So when COVID happened, everything went virtual and streaming. And how do you do this? So um, check out that podcast. I used to teach at a technical school, but now I do it on my own now. Um, I've worked at the, a local 10,000 seat amphitheater, being the system tech. And again, I love to serve at my home church as well. Um, it's 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 a it's a pleasure. Okay, so the the main topic for today is the importance of a well-designed and tuned sound system because no matter what console you got no matter how great your mix is just like adam said if at the end of the day what is downstream of that um, is a terrible system that's not pointing in the right direction so not the right fit for the room you're going to get bad results it's like trying to uh, color grade with night shift on or try and uh, or rose colored glasses if you will so let's jump into that so if you are a part of a new space you're, you're building for your church or maybe overhauling your existing one, one thing you are going to think about is, is the screen for the lyrics or maybe iMag or something like that. But would you ever put a screen where only half the people can see, assuming you only have one screen for the room, you're not doing multiple? Uh, you you wouldn't. <laughs> That's a pretty yeah. easy, <laughs> pretty easy thing to solve. Like, oh, everyone in the room needs to see what is happening on the screen, right? Or would you ever put a screen up there, an LED wall projector that only showed the color blue, that did not <laughs> represent the entire spectrum? That's not a great use <laughs> of resources either. So putting it in the wrong spot with not the right color, what that's not accurately representing your uh, what you're putting up there, your lyrics, your video content, your iMag, whatever. So the goal of a great sound system is to do the same on the audio world. We don't want anyone to auditorily squint or orally when they are listening to your mix or the pastor or anyone presenting on stage. And so if the screen is too small, everyone's squinting for your text. If the sound system isn't loud enough or there's not enough people able to hear, it's not covering the amount of people and coverage is something we're going to jump into. So that is my goal is I don't want anyone to work harder than they have to to listen to what is going on. All right. So let's talk about what influences the sound system design and tuning decisions uh, when someone like me who, who is designing a system for a specific space. So let's zoom out and start pretty macro. OK, so this is my job on one slide. I take the event goals. So let's talk about Sunday morning. Make sure the band sounds awesome. The pastor can be heard quite clearly. And anything else that's happening is easy to understand and engage with. And so no one is thinking about the sound system. I'm using data. So the, the design tools ahead of time and the measurement tools in the field and my own experience of like how I like things to, to sound. So someone asks you to mix a show, they're like, they're essentially saying to you, I like the way you think other things should sound or yeah. how we should sound. So those are their preferences. So I use like when you're those- commissioning an artist. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Choosing a like, tattoo artist or whatever it is. Absolutely. Yeah. Like I trust your creative intuition. So it's I'm blending all those things together. What do you need out of your Sunday more experience? The data that I can gather and then my own experience mixing that together into choosing how I accomplish that and spending the right speakers in the right place with the right aim and coverage at the right level with the right tone and timing. That's my job because at the end of the day, every seat matters. So when that isn't done right, mm. even entire swaths of your audience who are not getting accurate coverage or they're having a very different experience from the rest of the room. So over time, I've made a lot of mistakes and something that's been really helpful for me is the serenity prayer. And that kind of undergirds my, my own way of sifting through this craft. And it's God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. So this is in the 12-step program, if you're familiar with that. But I have to have all those three parts of the your event goals, data, and my own experience to know what I can't change. It's like, well, if we can't hang any speakers because this is a 150-year-old church and it can't bear the weight, then cool. I just have to move on. Like we can't hang speakers or Mm -hmm. uh, something that I can change of like, well, 
you have speakers on sticks, but they're all the way down. And like, wait, we have another four feet on the sticks. Let's get them higher in the air. We can fix that. And so in the wisdom of the difference, so over the time of getting to do this, of first being a mix engineer on both Sunday morning context and others, getting to drive a lot of systems, knowing they're like, well, that didn't work. And then translating to how can I make this better? So system design at the end of the day really isn't that hard. We usually have a stage and then there's a speaker of some sort that's pointed at the audience. So if it's pointed at the audience, we're doing a good job. So that's step one, point the speakers at the people. All right. Yeah. Uh, and if we don't do that, maybe point the stage, that's not so good. Okay. And so we're pointing at the walls or away from it. So number one, like, can you see every speaker it is pointed at folks? And I can use a lot of fancy tools like line arrays and other fancy software that I can make a line array do something like this. Um, and you, this is more like a rainfall map. And so the so red and yellow and orange might be louder that tapers off to blue, which is cooler or less loud. So it is quite loud for whoever is standing in front right here and whoever is above right here, it is not very loud. But I can also bend line arrays to spread out energy or any speaker mm -hmm. for that matter, just where I put them. And so I can use the same tool sets to match the sound that's coming from these speakers to your audience area. Okay, so now let's get a little bit more micro on what it looks like for your specific uh, experience uh, for, for the decisions that inform sound system design. So first is SPL. So how loud does it need it to be? Um, in my neck of the woods, it's, it's about two hour drive over to Tulsa. And I had the chance to go to church on the move when Andrew Stone was still there and attend a rehearsal. And at rehearsal, I walked in like, this sounds amazing, but like, this is huge. And it felt like twice as loud as whatever service on a Sunday morning I've ever mixed. And they're like, hey, this is this is like totally normal for us. And I was like, okay, cool. They like it bumping in here. That's great. Yeah. And they had they had a huge rig and it sounded great. So it's just gonna be different for every congregation versus if you go to a more liturgical setting, which is a lot of reading, you don't have any drums, maybe just an organ, it's not gonna be that crazy. So that's gonna weigh into what type of system or the amount of horsepower we need. Then also front to back level. Let's say you are in a congregation that's maybe migrating or evolving from more, um, maybe just a more hymn driven, piano driven thing. And now we're adding drums, we're adding more modern instruments into the fray. And we're wanting it to be a little bit louder, but you're still having to take along with you a congregation that may not be used to that. They're not going to those type of concerts. So you, if they're going to see James Taylor, they're running at 85 DPA or DBA. It's not, <laughs> yeah. it, uh, he has pretty quiet concerts because his, his audience is older. But we can actually make it to where front to back on purpose is not. It's it's an even gradient from front to back. So you can say like, hey, if you want it bumping, you can sit in the front. If you want it to be a little bit more relaxed experience, you can sit in the back, but it's still intelligible and we can see the quote unquote screen orally uh, from anywhere in the house. Also plays into it is aesthetic. We wanna make sure our system blends into the space as much as possible. Uh, we're not magicians. A lot of people ask us to like, well, how can I get sound without seeing any speaker? And that's impossible, but there are things we can do to make sure it suits your vibe. And we need to have impact in our systems. Do we need something that really hits us in the chest hard? Because no matter how much you spent on Bethel drum samples and running those live, if you don't have a system that can reproduce 40 hertz, that kick drum is still not going to sound like you want it to. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with snare. And budget. There are, are great brands at every price point. Uh, Adam and I were just talking earlier, you know, like RCF is like the perfect Honda Civic, like it's just gonna deliver, but it's not gonna break the bank. And there might be Meyer, who's above that, which is like Rolls Royce. Uh, you might need to like, if you just really don't have money, go with like a turbo sound rig. Uh, and they're all gonna get you different results, but they're at the end, of the end of the day, they're all speakers. People need to hear, they can put sound in the room and they're all helpful, but your budget will determine that. And then the venue and scale. So if you're in a giant uh, arena, that's gonna require a different number of speakers than one that might just require one. So I did an install yeah. a few months ago. Uh, it was a small A-frame church, I had about a hundred seats and we did it with one single speaker because we were able to get it up high, put the right one. And they were happy because that saved on budget. They were thinking we need to buy at least two because everyone has a left, right system. I was like, well, I want it higher so I can cover more people. Let's just put one in there. And they were super happy. And lastly, uh, the rigging logistics, like the, the actual bones of the room, like where can I put speakers is also going to play in that. And sorry, one more, we got time. 
Mm -hmm. If you're a portable church, uh, are you able to uh, get this out of the trailer and set up quickly? You're probably going to not have a ton of time to tune and get out your measurement rig. Like, can you just trust if I put the speaker here and here and get them up? Is it going to sound good? And lastly, talent preferences. So this might determine the type uh, and how, number of subs I put in array. And do you want to feel it in your chest on stage or do you want to be a very clean, quiet stage? And I can do fancy things with sub arrays to steer the energy so I can get it out in the audience, but not go back in the stage, or I can not do that. So you can feel it in your chest on stage. So how do we identify a system problem versus a mixing problem. So we talked about all these things that inform our decisions, but we think like, okay, well, I might need a system change. Is my mix really that bad? Or do I really need to get a better system so it can more accurately represent a great mix that I do have? Mm -hmm. at, the, at the end of the day, the speakers in our room almost act like flashlights. I really like to use visual analogies for sound because sound is just hard to understand. You can't touch it. You can't see it. You can, it's, it's just, it's subjective because everyone has different ears. And so a speaker is able to cover a certain area. So us as system designers, if we put the right amount of speakers in the room to subdivide and conquer and cover the area, it's going to make sure that everyone in the room has a great experience. So you can see if this were an audio rig, and we would never put this amount of speakers in this configuration, but stick with me here, there's a little mm -hmm. bit of a bright spot here in the middle. So if this were speakers, that means that person right there is going to get more sound energy than everyone else. So it's going to be a little bit louder. So we can do things to mitigate that. So you may have a great mix, but that person's going to experience that differently. So a specifically system issue that's common to separate this from a mix issue is one where speakers are not covering enough. So these are two speakers that are too narrow. They are aimed right here through the middle. And we have this graph up here that shows us red is zero decibels and it goes down from there. So this is like the uh, digital audio scale on a digital console. Your top is going to be zero. So the, again, the goal isn't to get the negative 18 like gain structure, but it is yeah. to get it to where the entire audience is the same color, at least similar colors. So unsurprisingly, people in the front, there's a lot of red. That's hot level. But as a speaker has farther to travel, we're going to lose level. And then, so that's not surprised there. And then these speakers are too narrow. These are like a really tight, like spotlight Lico that are highlighting just this part of the audience and it's leaving out these people here in the middle. So that's not right. But if we just swap speakers out, take the same positioning, we can help remedy that. And now everyone, for the most part, except here at these like very front corners, is now within a 6 dB span or plus mm. or minus 3 dB is like how people to say it. So that's a win in my book. And so, well, how do we parse out that specific problem again from your mix? So we're talking about something called horizontal coverage. So if we're looking at a bird's eye view, can we cover everybody? So on this map, if you are green on this system that I designed, that means you're within a plus or minus 3 dB span. Again, as a win in my book, and then I can do things with EQ on my line array to help make sure these spots get better. And then vertical coverage. So now looking at the side of the array, and I'm now using this line array to couple and do things in the back to make sure sound is getting all the way here. Uh, but it's about throwing a little over four times as far to the back than to the front. But I'm still able to make it a mostly even experience after some EQ, even though this this these speakers at the top are having to work four times as hard to make that happen. So this is a a, a photo from that actual design on the show, and this is the same thing here. This these top boxes are throwing all the way here to A, and then these bottom boxes are throwing out down here to D, and then we spread out and cover the room. So this is kind of the framework I'm thinking through of like, what is a good system doing to make sure it is even throughout? And what I'm looking at is tonality and level variance. So if I can get even tone, whereas, you know, if you're at the front and you have subs on the floor, you're probably going to get blasted with subs and there's a tiny little front fill sitting on the stage. So does yeah. that sound like a mismatch to you? <laughs> um, yeah. You know, these like 
bunch of 18s down here and then the sub so that might be rough but if we can get speakers in the air have thoughtful system design this is the magnitude response of each of those four spots so at a b c and d i stuck a microphone and just like an eq graph i could see it is following this white curve which is called my target curve this is the desired system response that i want out of a lot of music driven rigs and we can see here there's are these up and down little variances which are normal but for the most part it's following this curve and i have even tonality and as you can see even though point a is a lot farther to the back than point d these traces are also similar in level this is just straight out the box i'm not like moving them up and down to follow the curve they're yeah. all evil in, in level as well and so people understand too so i'm looking at this like the this spike up here on the my left side um that's like the low end frequencies and then where it dips off at the very end corner bottom right that's like the high frequencies and then the would it be spl or db would be the like the vertical up and down scale yes yes it would be yeah. thank you for clarifying that yeah so that is the um this zero line across here i guess we can call that zero then yes we have more low frequencies and less high frequency as far as level then yes the the x-axis is frequency so right here is about 100 hertz and here's about 1k and here's about 10k and so to kind yeah. of give your perspective and so this is fairly normal to see in a sound system maybe not quite this much for most people but this amount of extra low end beef uh, I know in studio setting, most people shoot for like a very flat system, so it'd be normal. But if I put a completely flat system in your room, you're going to be like, are the subs on? <laughs> it, it, yes. Yeah. We expect that out of a system in a live environment. And we can tailor that to your room. Depends on how re reverberant your space is and a, a number of other factors. But a well-designed system will have consistent tonality throughout the entire audience as much as possible. Okay, so if we take that, now flip over to like, well, can I trust my mix in here? It's almost like going to your car. In, in studio world, it's very common to have the car test of something may sound fantastic in your studio or on your headphones, and you take it out to the car, and you're like, what happened? What? And mm -hmm. that's because we really trust our car because we're in there all the time, we're listening to stuff, and we want them to what's called translate. So what I would do to maybe test out and verify, like, is my system doing this? Do I have even tonality and level? Can I sit at any of these spots, A, B, C, or D, or even somewhere on left or on the right to test out if I have even coverage? Is pick a song that you just know like the back of your hand. You've been listening to it since junior high or maybe even something just recent that just sounds great. Put it through your sound system and just take a walk. These things that you love about the song, for instance, one of mine that I use for sound system tuning is called Phoenix by Andrew Holmes. It has this wonderfully powerful kick and snare that's very spaced out. And I like that because it gives me time to think about what just happened. It goes kick, snare, <laughs> kick, snare. So it's a lot of time in between to be like, okay, I heard that kick, how did it feel? Uh, the snare is about to come up, I heard the snare, how did that feel? Do those feel equal in impact? The vocals, mm -hmm really mixed wonderfully on that it's out front but it's not bitey so it's like can't could did i hear every single syllable as i walked around everywhere uh, it's got really the drums are really impactful and have a lot of like deep bass to them but the snare also has a lot of snap to it so if the the snare sounds like it's under a blanket then that's a problem right and so you can pick a track that you know really well and uh, Adam mentioned before on the call, he had this Michael Jackson tune that he could listen to the hi-hats on it and predict what the slap back in the room was going to sound like. And so yeah. you can find all these sorts of little different things about a song that you know, and that's your, your, your guiding line because that removes the variable of your mix. And now you're just listening to this track that sounds good walking the room. So if you go to the front row and your head's getting ripped off, then you go to the back row and it sounds quiet, then that's a problem. We can, we can address that with the system. And again, I'm not asking you to spend a bunch of money on a new system. It's a lot of times just putting the same speakers you have in a different place. So that's something we can't mix or fix with EQ. So if you're hearing this from your congregation, it's hard to understand the pastor in the back. This is a common one, or not even the back, in, in just somewhere else. Or the front row rips my head off during the opening song. That's not a fun experience for anybody. Or maybe it's the announcement video at the top. 
or my bass sounds anemic on this PA. You might be hearing it from the musicians in your in your band. Maybe they're hearing another bassist play and now the audience are like, man, just the, the bass isn't just feeling right. What's going on? No matter where I stand. Or there is a very specific spot that everyone knows that actually sounds good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's the fourth row on the right side. If there's one spot, it's like, well, we need to make it sound even throughout the entire space. So if you are struggling to meet all these demands just through your mix, you're going to fail because it's not your fault at that point. The system is not doing what it should be doing. So one thing you can do to mitigate that is either get the system retuned or oftentimes re-hung. And so how often should you do that? Uh, So if you're currently really dissatisfied with the results, it's now. (laughs) But let's say you got it retuned and re-hung. How often should you check in on it and make sure things are cool? This is really similar to what you're doing with your car when you take it into the mechanic. You may not necessarily think there's something wrong with it, but like it's been a while between oil changes. Let's just, we're about to go on a long road trip. Let's just take it in and make sure it's good. So folks like me who are system engineers have tools that are basically audio x-ray machines. And this is the software that Adam was referring to. This one's called Open Sound Meter. You you also might have heard of Smart by Rational Acoustics. That's also a very common one. But we're able to use measurement microphones and put them in very specific spots around your room, capture data, and analyze what's going on. So what am I looking for? I'm I'm looking for the effectiveness of the current design. So you might be hearing from your congregation that it's loud in the front row and really quiet in the back. I could put a microphone at each of those two spots, capture the data, and I can verify that. So we can see here on this graph, this this magnitude one is the same. It actually has all the uh, the legend here for you. So this is plus or minus 18 dB, just like you might see on the EQ graph on your console. And this is all the way up from 31 hertz all the way up to 20. And this blue and green line are tracking similarly. So I'm, I'm like, cool, this is this is similar data. But if I had one line that was way up here and then the back row was way down here, that looks like a 18 to 9. That looks like a 27 decibel discrepancy, which yeah. is not good. <laughs> so I can verify like, hey, we can see these two lines are different. I can see that you're not getting the results that you want. So I can also look and see you may have the speakers put in the right space. It was sounding great, but things break. So I can verify like, hey, this this the speaker's broken. You need to get repaired or get a new one. Or I can see bad wiring. Sometimes you have the left one hang and then the right one, you might have uh, the polarity inverted. So that waveform is actually coming out upside down. So if you stand in between those arrays and they're both hitting your left and right ear, it feels like your brain's being turned inside out which is not fun. Uh, mm-hmm. That's a fun tr- trick to do one time with headphones on and you want to throw up afterwards. It's the worst. Uh, so I'm looking that I'm looking for level discrepancies. So maybe your front fill speakers, the speakers that might be sitting on the front of the stage versus the big main hang. Those are just way too loud compared to the mains. They need to be brought down a little bit. You could be running old firmware that doesn't have some of the features that can make things running better or differently, or it could just be an amp or some other component that's just going out and needs to be serviced or addressed. So basically this tool helps me sniff all that out or someone like me can come in and look at your rig and make that happen. Or for instance, this this church in Fort Worth reached out to me and wanted to get a new system. This is a couple of K-12s up here, and this one's covering this half of the room. This one's covering this half. But this room, I'm not quite standing all the way back, but it's only 30 feet wide, but 70 feet deep. So that's really long. And they were like, well, man, it's just screaming down here in the front. And these are the only speakers in the array, by the way. Uh, But we get all the way to the back. It's not very strong. Well, it's because these people in the front row are about 20 feet from that speaker. And the people in the back are more like 85 feet, considering the throw distance, Mm -hmm. which isn't good. So what I advocated for is like, Let's not worry about stereo in this environment. Let's take one speaker on the left side, hang it higher and put it in the middle. And then take that right speaker and put it farther back in the room to act as a relay speaker to where the front speaker is responsible for the front half of the room and the re speaker is responsible for the back half. Now I can literally cut their level in half because they're not having to do cover as much. I'm not asking them to go all the way to the back of the room. And now everyone can hear it's intelligible and they're getting great results. So again, it's not always about buying new gear. It's about repurposing what you have. 
Yeah, and I'll share a, a similar thing happened with a church I was at in in Illinois. I was a worship pastor there and um, walked into the room and there were three speakers in the center of the room. And so it was a cluster. So it was like, Mm -hmm. you know, here's one speaker, here's another, here's another mono system. But, you know, the space between, you know, the speakers are at this angle like this. So it's like anything that's in this area is all phase throughout the room. Yeah. So, um, I actually added a subwoofer. There's also only one subwoofer like on oh, one side of the room. So um, I added one subwoofer, but I took out one of the speakers. So it, it became, it got rehung, retuned by someone that knows how to tune rooms. And it to the congregation, it looked like I got rid of speakers because I went from three to two. Uh, yeah. But so... Um, but the, it was so much more even throughout the room. So there's there's a real life example of, um, or another one of using what you have to get a better result. It's not always about buying more gear. Absolutely, I love that. That's that's a really yeah. cool, really cool thing. I um, so yeah. So so what do you get when you have someone come inspect that who does know what they're doing? Is that you either number one get confidence that the system is sounding the best it can with the gear you have. So, and, that, and there's verifiable data. Whether your pastor wants to look at that data or is going to understand it, that's that's up to <laughs> up to him or her. But it, it's you can at least have a quantitative way of showing someone that like here's what's happening in your system, right? It's almost like when you go get that hundred point inspection on your car, and there's often a couple of columns, and it's either like brakes, red, yellow, green. Mm-hmm. And it's like people don't really understand like well how many millimeters do I have to be left on my tire tread it's like oh your your tires are at yellow right now and about another 10,000 miles are going to be at red come see us and so that's how I usually like to explain it is like your system's about a b minus right now but if we added one more speaker like a delay speaker your back row is going to be 80 plus they're gonna be like oh great cool how much is one speaker uh, 1200 bucks okay we can make that happen so okay. yeah uh so knowing the confidence um, to know that what you have, how is it performing? And also next steps, if there needs to be repairs made, because it's an old system, get it rehung or retuned or something just upgraded. Maybe that your, uh, your DSP is going out or there's a new firmware update that would give it some more features anyway, or you can get a hug just because you're, uh, you're nice people, us systems engineers. Mm-hmm. But anyway. Um, so next steps, uh, if you want to just learn more about this whole process, uh, or maybe talk to, talk to me about just taking a look at your design or your room, you can visit my website produced by mkc.com. Um, and you can, you can click on that button there to work with me, or if you just would go to the YouTube channel and check me out uh, again, cause I'm just one guy you've heard for the past 30 minutes, just see how I think, um, with all these videos and, and check some stuff out there. Anyway, I love helping the church get the best with what it has or find the next best steps forward so that their congregation can engage what's going on because everyone's taking a lot of time, money, and effort to make sure those couple hours on Sunday or Saturday night or whatever you're doing it uh, are meaningful. And sound ca- literally carries the message of what you're what's happening. So I think it's worth, worth investing in. Yeah, that's awesome. A lot of times um, in worship ministry school, we have students that are asking, you know, do we need new speakers? You know, how do we get our speakers sounding great? And a lot of what we focus on in our training is is how to mix. Here's how you, you know, get signal from a sound source on stage, how you process it with any number of mixing consoles, and how you get a great mix in the room and on live stream. And those are things that we can help you with at worship ministry school. But one of the things that we're, we're not doing is flying out and hanging speakers for you in the room. And I don't know if, if you're rigging certified or if you have to hire someone for that. But um, yeah, a lot of times I tell people, if you need a system tuned or if you need a new system, that's when you hire an integrator or yep. someone like Michael and, and learn from him on how to get the system in place so that when you get your great sounding mix, it comes through clear because we can help you get the mix, but um, someone like Michael is going to be able to help you get the system in the right place. So it's a really big, important part of it and grateful that you were able to to share with our audience, um, even help them identify 
what they might not have known was a problem. Sure. No, thank you so much, Adam, for having me on. I appreciate the work that you guys are doing because, again, if you have a great system but are able to capture the sources and process them well and represent that well, then, again, you only have half the equation. So um, anyway, thank you again so much. Uh, please reach out. Uh, shoot me an email. Any questions, shoot me a design. I would, I would love to help out. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Adam.